Good morning, everyone, again. Um, welcome to the uh, almost third talk today. Can you, can you hear me back there? Yeah, all right, good, very good. Um, so this is a talk about something we actually have in QMU for uh, ever since 014 already, but most people don't use it, so I figured it's a good idea to show you what, what exactly is going on and um, show you the benefits of, of what this means. AHCI, who knows what the abbreviation means? Who's ever used, okay, let's, let's say who's ever used HCI on, on a real machine? All right, those of you who don't raise their hands, you're wrong. Everybody's using it. <laughs> so who am I? Um, I'm Alexander Graf, I'm, I'm a QMU and KVM developer. You might have read my name in contexts that um, go in with everything weird and, and non-usual, like um, PowerPC, SV90, macOS 10, and, and SVM nesting, like running KVM in KVM, and lots of other weird things. Zeno, it, it's still active, yes. Um, it's gonna be, because I'm gonna be there soon. Um, so, HCI is just one more along the lines, but that one's actually more useful than the others. Uh, I didn't say that. So to understand what, what we're looking at, um, HCI is a storage adapter. Um, and, and to understand what, what that really means is we first need to understand what, what storage is, what situation we're in. So storage is basically just, well, we, we're trying to write data from, well, some application in, your, in our user space over to the disk. And we somehow need some places, some, some abstraction in between. Um, and I'm pretty sure not all of you are aware of what the actual nomenclature there is. So it's really simple once you, once you understand what's going on, but um, the, the people confuse names. So we, we have operating systems, those are easy, right? We got like Linux and Windows and all the other fun, fun things there. But um, once it gets to the distinct, distinguish, distinguish deviation, whatever, between um, storage controller and, and cable, that's hard. So back in the day, we used to have IDE, right? And IDE had like those really flat cables with like, that you could connect, with lots of pins. Um, th those are different things. We still have the IDE interface today, and you can even use the IDE interface on a SATA link. We have lots of storage controllers that actually emulate the IDE interface on SATA. So it also works the other way around. You can have an HCI controller that just exposes an HCI interface to the operating system, but below you're really using one of the old PATA cables. So those are different things, just, just so you know what the nomenclature really means. Now let's take a, let's imagine we, we are a file, we just want to drive down to the hard drive. How do we get there? Well, at first our user space application goes in and sends a write request, a write syscall sys over to the operating system. Now the operating system goes in and checks, well, I think this file is actually in multiple pieces somewhere in, our, in, in my memory because memory is, like the file is not linearly in memory, it's like scattered in different places. So what happens is the operating system then goes in and checks, well, let's see where all those, those, those pieces are and puts them in a table. That, that's what we call scatter gather lists. And then gives this table off to our storage controller, which then can read that table and put those pieces from memory directly on to our hard disk. Sounds simple, huh? Well, it's not quite, but the principle is. Now, of course, we're looking at KVM here, so we want virtualization in that game. Um, for virtualization, what this basically means is we just add yet another level of abstraction, which is always good, right? We always need another level. So we run a machine in a machine, and then inside there have a file that we want to, want, want, that we want to drive out to a real hard disk. But to do that, we basically have two hard disks now. We have one that is virtual to the virtual machine, and then we have the real one on the real hard disk again. So let's take a look at the process that a file takes again to get over from our application inside a guest to the host OS. Uh, to, to, the, to the hard disk, to the host hard disk. So what we do is we, we just add this one more level of abstraction and send everything down these layers. Application issues a write request that goes on to the guest operating system, which then does the same thing that it did before. It goes in, checks for all the um, different pieces, all the chunks where that file really is in its its memory, its view of its memory, and 
creates a scatter gather list, sends that over to its emulated hard disk. But what really happens is that um, I left out some parts here, but just so you get the, the broad point, what it, what it, what it means, um, it, at the end of the day, that one, again, in QMU, sends a real write request, just like the write request from the application that we had inside the guest. So we go the same way again. We do a write request of all those pieces and send that to the host operating system, which goes in, creates another scatter-gather list of those pieces again, which are at different locations, of course, because everything else will be simple. Creates a scatter-gather list of that, sends it over to the hardware, and the hardware writes it to the disk. Any questions so far? All right, very good. If you have questions, just raise your hands, I might um, call you. Now, this is one of the slides that I just put in every, uh, every, every talk I do. It's just a general overview of how virtualization really works and, and in, KV, in the KVM world. So um, what, which path do we go along um, the different user space and, and, and server, server, uh, user space and system uh, kernel space layers? So we have user space and kernel space and then again user space and kernel space inside the guest. If we want to write this file, that's the same thing I just showed you as a nice animation, but this time it's another animation. We start off at the program inside the guest, and that program goes over to the host kernel, does the write, uh, to the guest kernel, does the write. The guest kernel traps out into KVM. KVM realizes, oh wait, this is a device access. I actually need to forward that on to QMU. So it goes over to QMU, and QMU then looks up in a table wait, this device access to that specific address actually goes to this device code in my, in, in my code base. So it goes in and goes to the storage adapter emulation layer inside of QMU, which then handles that single request. And once it's handled it, uh, once, once it, it's realized, wait, this is a write, I need to write something out, it goes out to the host kernel, which sends it to the hardware, and then we're going back all the way. All right, <laughs> another layer of abstraction, right? It's always good to have another layer uh, or so. You can imagine that this is not exactly the fastest way to do things? Nobody, all right, you're all, you're all very fond of virtualization. Very good, very good. <laughs> so we, I'm, I'm, I'm taking a look at, at three different ways of doing block access here. I, I leave out all the SCSI part, we had that yesterday. So you're only looking at IDE, at HCI, and at virtio block. IDE is what we do today. IDE is what we usually have in a normal um, system that, that we emulate these days. So IDE is pretty complicated when it comes to programming one of those requests. So if we just want to write a single chunk to the hard disk, what does the operating system have to do? Wait, so the operating system needs to, at first, go in and write some tables like the scatter gather list and, and all the data actually um, into RAM. So that one's fine, we always need to do that. But then the fun starts. So IDE goes in and needs to set a lot of headers. We need to set the, fe the some, like feature bits, uh, the sector, another sector number, a cylinder, one more 16-bit advanced cylinder setting and all of those errors that you can see there. Every single one of them, you, you see the small animation down there? Um, that shows you the path we're going. I mean, th this is what's, what's happening today, seriously. Every single time, every single request goes through all those hoops just to issue a single write request. Can you imagine that this is slow? <laughs> all right, very good, very good. At least, at least that one. This, this really is slow, I mean, it's, it's obvious. I'm, I'm actually surprised by the speed we're getting out of IDE. I I'm, I'm really am. Now, HCI tried to solve all of this, and it, it actually does a pretty good effort at that. So what we do in HCI is we just, well, store the tables in RAM again, and then say, go. And then we do the write request, that's it. We just send a single FIS, a, like the thing that actually is transferred along the wire between the storage controller and the actual hard disk. We send, just send that to the controller, the controller sends it on, be done. You just kick it off, go, good. No, we, we only have a single exit there, really, to programming. Well, a couple more, but it's not, not that bad as an IDE. 
Build IO block is even nicer, as some of you probably would like to hear. Um, because build IO block is very similar to HCI. We also write some information in RAM and then send a kick and go. Everything just goes off. But it can do things in parallel, so that's a lot nicer. We, we, but we'll get into that later. Um, so looking at the communication layers we have between our storage controller and our, um, our operating system. Very old IDE, like this is the stuff back 20 years ago, 30 years, I don't know how, how old IDE really is, it's, it's ancient. Nobody uses that anymore, but that's what IDE read, read origins from. IDE back then sent every single like byte basically over through a single command out to the bus. So every byte, even from the data you're trying to write, goes out all the way to the bus, which means in virtualization speech, every single time you're taking an exit, you're going all the way around to QMU and back again, for every byte, almost. I think, really, PO is doing bytes, usually. So even on real hardware, people figured that this might be slow. So because the PO bus is just slow, um, the PO ports, port IO. Um, so they instead figured, well, let's just put all the data, at least, put that in a generic place somewhere in RAM um, and just chove over, like just use that, that port IO interface only for communication to kick things off, to, to really do um, control. Like basically that's the control, control plane, the control bus, the control um, way, and, and all the data goes through RAM so because that's what both people, bo both sides can access. And RAM is obviously faster than just um, sending single requests through the bus. So this is what IDE does today. Um, HCI is very, sim very similar. Um, it's just that it sends less data over the control path, which is the slower path. So it, it shows even more over to RAM. And Virdio block does the same thing, really. It's just that instead of doing DMA to RAM, it defines that it doesn't do DMA, uh, but just accesses RAM, which is very similar, but unfortunately not the same thing. So that's, that's definitely one advantage of HCI, and one that, that alone should be reason enough to use it. But there's more. There really is more. So IDE has this cool thing that's called, um, we can only do a single request at a time. Which means, every time we send a write request, we need to finish it because we can send another write request. Which, if you think about it, doesn't sound that bad, unless, well, just imagine you got like a rate controller with like five disks in the back end and you could actually saturate all five of them. Unless, well, you can't write everything at once. You always have to wait for the first disk to, con to basically finish if, you, if your blocks are not well aligned. You have to wait for your, for your first disk to finish until you can actually write to the second disk because you don't see it as an abstract level in the OS. So um, this is pretty bad when you are doing any, and when you have any, anything on the host that can actually either cache or do things in parallel, which in virtualization we usually have because we're usually caching things, at least I am. Um, so HCI improves that, that um, you can send out multiple requests at the same time. You can actually say, hey, I want to send out four requests and then have an asynchronous callback, like an, just an interrupt, that tells the US, all right, my request is done. Sounds like a simple addition, but um, that's basically the, the magic po potion to, to speed. Now, virtio is even nicer. Virtio can do all of that asynchronously. Um, so you can send off your first write request, and all the others don't even have to kick the host. You don't even have to exit anything at all. You just add additional information to your ring, and if the host is slow enough, which might happen, um, th then you can even run, if you have two, th two threads that can run in parallel, they, they can process everything without exits, which is even faster. So the big question that, that people, I mean, the, the big reason why I even looked at HCI, I mean, I don't, I don't really care about speed. I mean, we got Virtio on, on, on Linux and Windows and, and all the other OSs, who really cares, right? Um, for, for those, we can just use IDE, we're good. Well, we can't. See the red line there, the red cross? On OS X, we can't use IDE. IDE is too old. It doesn't support it anymore. It's just, there's, there's, a, single, there's a single IDE controller that Mac OS X supports, which is only used for CD-ROM drives. And I don't feel good 
plugging a disk in there and claiming that this is a real machine. So if we want to support Mac OS X as a guest, we, we need something like HCI. That's the reason I started it. But there's a lot more reasons to really use HCI. I mean, take a look at that, that table. Um, Imagine in five years from now, would you care about Windows XP support? I wouldn't. So in five years from now, we would basically have green ticks on all OSs out there. Every OS that runs on real hardware basically has to support HCI because it's such a big standard that everybody's using it. So by supporting HCI, we basically support fast storage on all operating systems. Whereas on Virtual Block, we need to go in and write drivers. And I'm not a Windows developer. I can, I can write Windows drivers. And I'm pretty sure most of you guys can't either. I mean, if you sit down for a couple of years, maybe you would. But writing Windows drivers is, is incredibly hard. Yeah. <laughs> Plus, I don't really want to sit down and write drivers for macOS and BSDs and Solaris and whatever either. So, um, if we get something that's reasonably fast for free and just say, well, we declare this OS as first class citizen so it's really fast on Vodaio and all the others get this almost as fast HCI adapter, I'm good. That's, that's best enough effort for me. But to put all that into, into some scope, um, this is a really, really simple benchmark. So um, it's, it's basically, it's probably the worst benchmark you can do, but it's very simple. So that's why, why we have it here. Um, I just created a sparse file in tempfs, passed that through to the guest, and did a dd from it with, uh, I, with iFlag equals the direct, so it doesn't use the guest page cache. And as you can see, HCI is right in between IDE and Virtio block on the speed level. So for HCI, we, like, with just streaming data, we are already faster. Now imagine parallel disk requests coming into that game. I mean, I did this benchmark on a, on a netbook, on an Atom, small Atom, which is why the numbers are so low. Usually you should see multiple gigabytes of, per second of throughput. That's just some 100 megabytes. But the, the scale always is the same. Even, even on big boxes with like three or four gigabytes per second on, on speed, I get the same scale. I, HCI is right in the sweet spot in between IDE and Virtio block, right in the middle there. If you have a storage system that can actually handle multiple requests better than my usual um, TempFS can do, then you see even better results on HCI compared to IDE. Now, since we still have some time left, Let's go for something that people always find confusing, and I've never seen any good slides on it, so I just prepared some myself. Um, if well, those guys of you who wrote that code, just, just don't listen to it now, because you know what it's doing anyways. Um, everyone else, I haven't found a single person who immediately knew what cache equals write through, cache equals write back, whatever means. Cache equals write through means really, really slow. Yes. No. Even the people who work on that code don't quite understand. <laughs> So just the quick thing, so we actually have it on, on video, so people outside can really will know what it means as well, um, until we deprecate it again in a couple of months, probably. So caching means, caching in general, just means that instead of writing every single write request once to the disk, we batch them up and send them as a bunch over. That's essentially what caching just means. Um, and for cache equals write through, we have this um, awesome thing that for every write request that we do, we immediately flush it out, always send it out to the disk. Every single request that the guest sends immediately gets sent out to the disk. That's what write through means, really. And because we already sent everything out, when the guest says, hey, I'm, a, I'm at a synchronization point, I really want to flush things now to the disk because your disk cache is hurting me since I really need um, my data to be, to be um, really on the disk. Well, it already is, so we can ignore that. that that's what write through does. Write back does what you would expect. It just batches them up, and as soon as the guest says, hey, I'm at, a, I'm at a synchronization point, please flush now, we flush. And unsafe is my favorite. It just doesn't do flushing. <laughs> don't, don't do it at home, kids. Don't do it at home. If you're in a production environment, don't use unsafe. If you just want to install a guest, man, it's fast. <laughs> K 
cache equals none basically just leverages the disk cache. So um, instead of using our host memory as cache, we just directly send all the requests immediately to the disk to, through the host controller without going through any other infrastructure, which means we basically use the disk cache of the disk. Well, or not, un un unless it's broken. It, that's, that's quite a couple of cases where cache equals none doesn't work. Don't, don't try to use it on tempfs. It just won't do. So now for the big question, um, why, <laughs> why do we actually need HCI? Um, I, I guess most of you people can actually um, get to that conclusion uh, by now. It's faster, it's more compatible, it's um, even more compatible because, uh, well, we, unless with our block, we can use like CD-ROM drives, you can attach it in a DVD drive directly because we're just, just speaking the normal ATA commands. And I don't need to write drivers, that's a good part. Some ideas for the future. Um, I would like to see a new machine model, uh, Q35, which we have halfway in QME already. And that's basically an ICH9. And, and why would we want to have an ICH9 with a PX4 IDE controller? We could just use HCI as a default, right? Um, and by then, everybody would just be using HCI and we're good. And I'm missing MSIX support still, which is not that big. We're doing MSI, but MSIX can actually send interrupts per disk. So we can notify the, 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 the guest directly that this disk finished and not those, that the host controller did something. All right, questions? <laughs>